This is the Ronin Philosopher, where I take a look at martial arts and try to examine them from a philosophical perspective in terms of pop culture, culture, technique, and just certain events that happen across its history. Today, I want to address the question that has been in my mind ever since I came, first came across the argument between traditional martial arts, mixed martial arts, and military martial arts. And that question being, is sport martial arts bad for military martial arts or vice versa? The inspiration for this came across a show that I was uh, watching a few years ago where two fighters, one was an MMA fighter and the other one was more of a brawler, went to Israel to do um, a Krav Maga training course. And in that course, the one guy who was an MMA fighter fought several guys one at a time but he had five seconds to beat each one of them. If he didn't beat them, the next person would come out and he would have to fight both of them at the same time, and so on, and so on. The outcome didn't matter. Needless to say, the visitor who was versed in mixed martial arts, as well as the one who was a brawler, had a very difficult time of it because, as one of them admitted, they struggled with having to adapt to the training. They were used to more one-on-one -on -one fighting particularly the MMA fighter who had been trained to go to the ground and try to win that way felt that he was out of his element because every time he tried to go to the ground the Krav Maga trainee would be able to hold his own long enough for his um, companion to come back out and assist him. Later on I remember coming across several comments about that episode where some people thought this was the definitive proof that grappling was a weak martial art and could not stand up to strikers, whereas strikers uh, were seen as more or less kind of cheating because they couldn't handle a grappler unless it was more than one of them. And this has been an ongoing debate since the first UFC way back in the 1990s. What got my attention rather was that the perception that sports martial arts were now seen as weak because it appeared that because of the fact that they shot short of doing lethal takedowns or lethal strikes or anything like that, you know, killing and maiming and whatnot, that it, that it essentially held it, the style itself, and the practitioner back as martial artists. Now, this is an argument that is not just brought up with mixed martial arts, but many popular pop culture martial arts as well, such as Taekwondo and the various styles of uh, Kung Fu and Karate. Recently, Pincot Sila has become very popular in the last 20 years or so, and even now, that has become to start to fall under that question as well, which is particularly um, peculiar to me since Sila is rather well known for being lethal and maiming in nature. So to properly address this issue, I feel that it's important, it's important to go back to the beginning, the beginning of more or less all martial arts that martial arts are pr primarily developed not for sport but for combat. They were designed to maim people or hurt people enough that they either stopped fighting or that you would have had if, end up having to kill them. In Japan for example, um, in the feudal eras, the samurai who lived in the rural um, areas in the mountains tended to regard other samurai from Kyoto and other cities as being weak because they got too bloated and too lazy from being comfortable after um, living out in a time of peace when they just came out of a time of war. Another example um, is with Pancration, where that style, though it's famous for being used in the, the original Greek Olympics, was also used in combat as well and was well known for its brutality, something you don't usually see when it's practiced nowadays. And even more recently, in the last century, with Bruce Lee and his development of Cheat Kune Do, the style was developed from Bruce Lee's experiences with street fighting rather than fighting in competitions, something that uh, many modern fighters have criticized him for, whereas they appreciate his influence, but at the same time don't hold his techniques and everything in much regard because he was an actor, not a fighter, at least according to them. Yet. It is well documented that Bruce Lee was particularly infamous for getting in street fights all the time. So it's not like it came from a total vacuum in the first place. So from these examples, you could make the argument that if you practice with limitations and don't prepare for extremes, 
you will end up fighting with those expectations in real life because your mind has trained your body to react that way subconsciously and the body will behave that way and when it is required to do something lethal it's not prepared to do it there's that split second of hesitation and in that split second they could potentially die or themselves get hurt however the opposite is also true if a person has been trained to fight to kill restraint is particularly hard when it's legally required for them to do so such as with veterans or even with cops at times. I've heard stories where veterans who come back from war have a very difficult time not critically injuring people or killing people outright because that's what they've been trained to do and that's what war has basically molded them into, basically killers, not fighters. And the idea of holding back is just non-existent. Hence, any, any veteran who is well sound of mind and whatnot usually will do all they can to avoid a fight and stay out of areas or influences or triggers that will put them into a kill mode or survival mode. Basically, think Rambo, but instead of invoking cops and Russians, if you're familiar with the old 80s movies, he kind of walked away from it and just went on with his life. Now, some of this can't really be avoided. Part of the reason why martial arts have become so popular in the West is that by nature, people who started training in the West for them had to limit what they can teach. You're not going to teach a five-year-old how to grab someone's throat and crush it, or to grab someone's nutsack and then squeeze it so hard that it either kills them or they're in serious pain for the rest of their fucking lives. Training like that would not fly with parents, let alone law enforcement, whose job it is to make sure that shit like that does not go down. Also to take into consideration is the fact that many people in the West, and in the East now as well, take up martial arts to learn discipline, deal with stress or PTSD, and even, yes, do self-defense, but not self-defense to the point where they're ripping people's throats out. They're not initially taking it to kill people. So yes, if styles like Krav Maga and Silat want to become successful outside their own countries, cultures, and organizations, they're gonna have to teach restraint. There's just no way around that. Now, all that being said, it is also important to note that if they train with those limitations, there may be certain situations that they're just not going to be prepared for. They're not going to be prepared not to go to the ground in a street fight where someone's going to stomp your head as soon as you try to take someone down or just simply pull out a gun and blow your fucking head off. All that being said though, I feel like it doesn't mean that the martial arts itself have devolved into some sort of kid's play, so to speak. As I said before, it's not uncommon back in the old days where people would fight each other to the death or to maim each other just to prove a point, defend their honor, defend their skills, or just because they just happen to like fighting. The reason why that is not necessarily the best idea though, even back then and especially in today's world, is that if you're trying to get more students to come to your school and learn your style, having a high kill count for only those who happen to survive the training is not exactly the best method way to go or way to go about that. People who fail or who are weak, and yes, I can attest to this, can still learn from their mistakes and get better. It's not necessarily survival of the fittest. I've heard that in the Russian uh, Special Ops Forces Spetsnaz, rather than take the highest ranking or highest skilled soldiers from other military ranks and professions to make them special forces and whatnot, they'll take any soldier, train them extremely hard, and will make them and forge them into special ops level soldiers. So basically, the point being that even in a, without civilian martial arts, you need your students and your fighters and your, your actors for your movies to come back because eventually, if you don't do that, no one's going to, and you're gonna go out of business. Another point I would like to make is that even if you do happen to, ex to train yourself for those kind of extremes, the reality is that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that will prepare a person for the reality of an actual battle. I'm not just talking about reaction times and move sets and things of that sort. I'm also referring to the fear. The fear that this is someone who's, who you don't know. You haven't watched videotapes of what they do. The fear that can be that there's someone else who's trying to harm you besides the person who's in front of you, that may be beside you or behind you. I'm referring to the fear that at any point, guns or knives or anything of that sort might be drawn and suddenly, Rather than just beating someone down or restraining them, 
you are now forced into a kill or be killed situation that you now cannot back out of. The experience of life, not just human experience, is dealing with the limitations and either adapting to them, overcoming them, or surrendering to them. In all three, there is always a margin of error and elements that we simply cannot predict, because that's life. I find the argument of even learning to fight lethally over a sport kind of stupid, because the unknown is always going to exist regardless. Whether it's someone you watch a videotape of and uh, you fight next month in Las Vegas, or as a soldier across the battlefield who you've never seen before, you don't know what their tactics are or anything of that sort, you just know your own training and that you are either going to be killed or going to kill that other person. Simple as that. For myself, as I've said before in other videos, I've studied several different martial arts and I can attest by experience, both winning and losing, that no matter how skilled or how experienced you are, all it takes is one lucky shot or one bad move or just being a cocky asshole to give yourself a bad day. So the element of surprise is always going to be there. It's said that even Masashi Miyamoto, Japan's greatest swordsman, trained with one eye closed to train for the element or surprise that if he happens to lose one eye, he still has to fight. Perhaps the most interesting element about this argument though, going back to Miyamoto, is that that element can also be exploited by the other person. You can use the unknown to your advantage. And if a person is expecting you to behave a certain way, you could not behave that certain way or set them up that you think that they're going to think you're going to behave that way only to do something else in order to win the fight or battle. And Masashi Miyamoto wasn't particularly notorious for this. Now all this to say is doesn't mean that a person should not train. Training does go a long way to being prepared. But the person who acknowledges his own, his own lack of knowledge is probably the best one to be able to adapt to whatever situation happens to fall upon them. Lastly, and I've said this before, martial arts for sports or demonstration should not be criticized for their limitations. Boards don't hit back, but I'd rather see demonstrations than see a bloody and twitching limb or head on the ground squirting blood. This isn't the gladiator games of ancient Rome, where such things were particularly commonplace after all. Spectators, movie watchers, and practitioners can still appreciate the styles and moves being done while acknowledging at the same time that it's not being taken to the full extreme. There's nothing particularly wrong with that, as long as they're aware of it. And that particularly leads to my conclusion on this particular idea, that sports martial arts are not damaging for martial arts in general. Likewise, combative martial arts are not damaging for martial arts in general either. It's a simple matter of give and take. To have one means to give up certain aspects of the other, but apply whichever suits your situation the best. If the person is gaining a positive experience from it, one way or the other, then great, that's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's a need to judge other people who may not do that. And I think we should just kind of learn to just basically li live with each other, except where we each tend to practice our own styles and appreciate what we all do.